Good morning. Today I would like to present a talk on a null hypothesis for Pacific decadal climate. And by decadal, I mean all the frequencies of variability that are larger than decades, uh, but I don't mean a preferential peak at the decadal time scale. Now, this is work in collaboration with Dr. Lori Trenary, who's here in this room, and Dr. Jason Furtado, and other colleagues that are part of the DOE PODEX grant, Nicola Schneider, Mike Alexander, Bruce Anderson, that are here, and others. Going back to the flavors of tropical variability and the two types of uh, Eastern Pacific and Central Pacific ENSO, which are clearly evident by taking correlations of their corresponding indices with sea surface temperatures, uh, what I'd like to point out is that there are important feedback dynamics that uh, essentially lead to the growth of these anomalies in the tropics. And one of them involved uh, essentially a dynamic coupling that involves the ocean. And these are feedback mechanisms that involving equatorial upwelling, uh, winds, thermocline depth, and zonal current. But we also know that in a tropical basin, there are other feedback dynamics that can lead to growth. And in particular, there's a thermodynamic coupling that is referred to as the west feedback or wind evaporation sea surface temperature that is also important in amplifying uh, sea surface temperature anomalies in the tropical uh, latitudes. Now, these two type of feedback dynamics act uh, differently. The dynamic coupling that involves the ocean typically uh, uh, evolves along the zonal plane at the equator. And so I'm going to refer to this kind of dynamic coupling that involves the ocean as a zonal mode dynamics. In contrast, the thermodynamic coupling involves the meridional plane. And as such, I'm going to refer, actually, as it has been referred to as meridional mode dynamics. Now, the meridional mode dynamics have been linked to precursor patterns of ENSO. And perhaps the earliest studies was one by Penland in 95, where she showed that uh, the year before a peak ENSO, there was a particular SST pattern that developed in the extra tropics that looks like this. And later, Dan Vimont, with his seasonal footprinting work, showed that this pattern is excited by variability in the atmosphere by the uh, North Pacific Oscillation uh, pattern. And, and this, uh, there's also a lot of work for people in this room, like Mike Alexander, that have shown that this is a nice precursor of ENSO variability. But as I was pointed out yesterday by you, uh, also the Central Pacific ENSO has some kind of precursor in the extratropics that looks very similar um, to this NPO SST uh, pattern. So let's look at that. So this is the, essentially the, the, the lead pattern to the Central Pacific warming, and this is the SST anomaly. And this is the atmospheric correspondent. This was showed by you yesterday. And so you can see that essentially this NPO pattern in the atmosphere has the ability to excite both uh, a canonical type of ENSO or a non-canonical type of ENSO. So essentially, once the, the sea surface temperature anomalies of the excited by the NPO reach the tropics, they essentially can ignite, if you like, the zonal mode dynamics. So there is a clear uh, connection between meridional mode dynamics and zonal mode dynamics. So talking about the NPO, uh, we know then that this uh, a second pattern of atmospheric variability of the NPO can excite sea surface temperature anomaly through the west feedback that reached the Central Pacific uh, in the onset of the El Ninos. And depending on what the tropical state is, the zonal mode dynamics can lead to a typical El Nino or a Central Pacific type El Nino. And so we can say that as a statement that the meridional mode dynamics energizes tropical interannual variance by exciting uh, zonal mode dynamic responses in the tropics. We also know that this tropical variability and these two flavors have important teleconnections to the extra tropics, for example, to the Aleutian Low for the typical El Nino. This was pointed out by Mike Alexander. And that also it has an effect, this type of atmospheric variability has an oceanic uh, response into the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And in fact, people have discussed the PDO as a reddening of the ENSO spectra. This is work by Matt Newman and Nicola Schneider here. But we also know of my recent work that also the Central Pacific warming pattern has teleconnections to the NPO, and in fact it drives a deterministic fraction of the NPO variability, mostly in the low frequency, that is then integrated into the ocean, into the second pattern of the cadal variability of the ocean uh, in the North Pacific, which we term the North Pacific gyro oscillation. Now, if we look at these two types of El Ninos, and we look at their power spectra, we find something that is interesting. And that is that uh, the Eastern Pacific El Nino has this typical uh, interannual band peak around four year, whether the Central Pacific El Nino has essentially a biannual peak and then has this low frequency energy. Now, yesterday in Fei Chin talk, we discussed how zonal mode dynamics could account for a four year and a two year peak, but could not account for this decadal variance. So the question then is uh, what is the source of this decadal power in the tropics? 
And is this decadal power of the tropics controlled by zonal mode dynamics, or perhaps by something else? In the Atlantic, for example, we know that where the zonal mode dynamics are weak, the meridional mode dynamics are the dominant mode of variability, and they're predominantly a decadal or lower frequency time scale. So the question then is, can the meridional mode in the Pacific act as an independent and perhaps primary source of the tropical decadal bands? So in other words, if we go back to our diagram, our hypothesis is that the meridional mode injects decadal scale variance in the tropical system and is responsible for this ENSO-like decadal variability and essentially by igniting zonal mode dynamics. And the zonal mode essentially responds and amplifies the meridional mode anomalies in the tropics and excites these teleconnections that add further memory uh, to the extratropical couple system. Well, the question is, is the observed decadal evolution of the Pacific consistent with this view? Well, what, to approach this, uh, we're going to begin with a very simple analysis. We're going to take the NOAA sea surface temperature anomalies from 1950 to 2012 and apply an eight-year low-pass filter. We will then compute the first EOF of uh, this low-pass data between 10 south and 10 north, essentially in the tropics, and find that this EOF captures the decadal variability and explains about 50 to 60 percent of the variance. And then we're going to characterize the decadal evolution of the variance by making lead lag correlation maps with this first PC and the eight-year low-pass SST. So this is what it looks at lag zero, this correlation map, and you can see the typical ENSO-like decadal pattern. If we look at the lead lag uh, maps, we find that at lead time of about two years, we find this kind of horseshoe pattern in the extratropics, which resembles the meridional mode. And then at lag time, we find again a, a signature in the extratropics. And so the inference here, or at least what we'd like to show, is that this evolution, this or you know, kind of decadal precursor of the decadal evolution, is associated with meridional mode in the extratropics that initiate essentially the evolution of this specific decadal variability. And this second part of the extratropic expression at lag is essentially controlled by the teleconnected response of the zonal mode in the extratropics, essentially the teleconnections to Aleutian Low and, and, and so forth. So, of course, the question is, how can we attribute cause and effect when we just have, you know, correlation maps and, you know, done where there's everything embedded in there? So, our goal then is first to design experiments to isolate the fraction of this decadal evolution that is controlled by the zonal mode dynamics. And we can do that um, by taking uh, a general circulation model of the atmosphere coupled with the mixed layer model. And we can prescribe time-dependent observed sea surface temperature only in a tropical strip between 10 north and 10 south. Then we will take, essentially, perform an ensemble of calculation and take the ensemble mean, in this case 50 realization. And this will allow us essentially to filter out any extratropic stochastic forcing. And so we're essentially going to look at the deterministic evolution of the decadal variance that is forced by tropical variability along the zonal plane, which is predominantly controlled by zonal mode dynamics. So let's look essentially at this evolution. Let's look at lag zero. So here we perform the essentially exact same analysis that we have here. So you're looking at a correlation with the low pass SST. So in the tropics, of course, the, the pattern is prescribed. So these two are identical with the observation. But in the extratropics, the model has the ability to adjust. And so this pattern that you see in the extratropic is essentially driven by teleconnections, you know, excited by the tropics, and it's very similar to the observations. If we now look at the future evolution, we find that also the future evolution uh, captures very well this extratropical successor. And now the question is, how about the extratropical precursor? Well, let's look at it, and if we do that, we find that there is no extratropical precursor. So essentially, the zonal mode alone cannot drive, you know, this extratropical decadal precursor which seem to be important in the observations. So the question then becomes, is this precursor controlled by meridional mode dynamics? Now to address this question, we're going to perform an additional experiment with this uh, general circulation model coupled with the slab ocean. And this time we're going to integrate the model for 1,000 years and have a mixed layer everywhere, including the tropics. What, does this, uh, what this does for us, essentially, it eliminates the zonal mode dynamics that are dependent on, on ocean, you know, thermocline, and so forth. Now, this particular model has also uh, essentially no cloud feedback, which is important, so that most of the tropical variability should be controlled uh, by meridional mode dynamics, so essentially this west feedback. 
So let's look one second at the output of this model and let's look at the first UF in the tropical Pacific between 10 south and 10 north. It captures about 50% of the variance. This is the spatial pattern. These are the first 200 years of the temporal evolution. We find that in the spatial pattern, it's centered around the central Pacific, whereas the landing, you know, of course, the meridional mode has a very good low frequency energy. We can ask the question, is there an extratropical precursor associated with the meridional mode in this model? And if we do this, uh, compute the meridional mode with the techniques illustrated by Weimert and Chang, uh, this is essentially the meridional mode pattern that we get. We can make a principal component for this meridional mode pattern, and we can see, we can verify whether it leads the tropical variability. And if we do that, we find that essentially this meridional mode time series leads by six months the tropical mode, or UF1 of the tropics, with a correlation of 0.7. That's pretty high. And so really what this tells us is that the extratropical stochastic forcing of the meridional mode dominates the tropical variability. Now it's also interesting to note that if you look at the temporal evolution of this data, as I said before, it's mostly characterized by decadal scale variance. This power spectra is very red. It doesn't have that kind of interannual, it has maybe a little bit, but essentially it's a red power spectrum. So we can go back to our decadal evolution here for the observation in the zonal mode, and we can now compare it with the one that has only meridional mode dynamics. Let's start with lag zero. So at lag zero, we find that essentially this meridional mode only model can reproduce the shape and correlation you know, of the, of the, uh, the decadal-like uh, variants of the tropics, it, but it's missing these extratropical imprints. Now what's interesting now that if we look at the precursor pattern, however, we find that this model does have the precursor pattern associated indeed with the meridional mode, which we just saw, which pretty much matches what we see in the observations and what we didn't see in this zonal mode experiment. Now if we look at the future evolution of this decadal variance in the meridional mode experiment, we find that at lags of about two years, uh, there is no pattern uh, in the extratropics. And so the question, and in fact this mode essentially dies slowly in the tropics, it doesn't ignite teleconnections. And why is that? Well, the reason is if we have to look at the size of the SST anomalies, this is just correlation, so we don't have a quantity for the size, but if we look at the size, we find that in the extratropical precursor, okay, the size of the SST anomalies in the observations and the meridional mode only is about 0.3 degrees C, which is consistent uh, with what we see in the in the observations. However, when we look at the tropics, the SST anomalies uh, for the observational 0.5, whether essentially in the meridional mode case, the SST anomaly are dying off, they're 0.1. So what this means essentially, or what the inference is, that is that when these anomalies reach the tropics, they don't have the ability to be amplified, for example, by zonal mode dynamics, and so they essentially die there, and they don't give rise to these teleconnections. However, they do modulate this decadal energy that, if you had zonal mode, could be amplified, and so that could produce this kind of decadal scale uh, evolution. So to summarize then, what we have is we found that the extratropical precursor in this decadal evolution is not forced by the tropics and not by the zonal mode, but is likely connected to stochastic forcing of the meridional mode, and that the extratropical successor is forced by the tropics and is connected to the zonal mode response. In other words, you need this zonal mode response. Now, these are just preliminary work, and this is work that is led uh, in our PODEX project by Dr. Trenary, who is here in the room, who is preparing a manuscript where she's uh, essentially augmenting this analysis uh, to add uh, data from simulation of the CCSM4, which allows us better to separate uh, you know, these meridional mode and zonal mode contributions to the decadal evolution. So to summarize, what we have is we talked about uh, the flavors of ENSO here in the tropics. We have this ENSO-like decadal power. Perhaps we, 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 we talked about the fact that this interannual variability and the decadal variability are not necessarily uh, you know, the same kind of feedback dynamics. We talked about stochastic forcing in the extratropics and how this stochastic forcing in the extratropics can lead, can excite essentially a Pacific meridional mode. We know that this excitation of the meridional mode has an impact on these ENSOs or these flavors of ENSOs, and there are going to be more talks this afternoon on this by Bruce Anderson, I think. Uh, but here we show that the PMM can also be a primary source for decadal modulation of this ENSO-like decadal variability in the tropics. And in fact, consistent with, uh, with this hypothesis is also some work that is currently being submitted for publication by Dr. Fortado, uh, 
who analyzed the CMIP climate models and found that uh, the models that better represent the Pacific Meridional Mode are also the ones that better capture the decadal statistics. So this, of course, is not any proof, but it's consistent at least with this kind of uh, idea. Now, we also know that uh, these type of uh, tropical variations can also have a deterministic link back to the forcing pattern of the PMM. But however, the role of this kind of return link still has to be further understood. And Dr. Yu yesterday gave us some indication that this could play a role in, in adding additional uh, persistence uh, to the decadal variance. And of course, lastly, another point that came out yesterday is that what is the statistics of the stochastic forcing and are these really independent or is there modulation from the background state? And this is all I have to say. Thank you.